So welcome to everybody online. Thanks for everybody in the um, in the audience as well. So um, we'll go through a couple of real life examples. I'll talk about the um, economics, etc., behind some of the logic behind why we produced this product in the first place. So. Year of the customer. I stole this strap line from one of our customers. This is um, Magna Exteriors strap line this year, and the reason that they've got this big focus on the customer, which you know tends to be a bit old hat. You know, you have to listen to your customer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But their view and mine is that you know competition has never been greater. The global competition for business has, has never been greater and so a focus on the customer is absolutely essential if you're going to survive in this industry. So the presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about industry trends as I see it, the things that our customers are talking about, the pressures they're facing and why we have developed the product, the problems that the product is designed to solve and the examples that Jim gives, we've sort of taken um, half a dozen examples from some of our customers and you can see them up here, Mint, Carlex, Creative Foam, Challenge Manufacturing, uh, another tier one supplier and we've sort of mashed their ideas together to produce a couple of generic um, demonstrations that doesn't impinge on anybody's um, uh, you know IP or doesn't you know uh, get us into trouble with any non-disclosure agreements. So the companies that we've, we've chosen um, 300 to 3,000 employees. They're in the um, automotive, aerospace, medical, energy industries. Um, most of them, or their principal business, is mostly automotive, tier one type suppliers. Um, Ty mentioned that we're very much focused on discrete manufacturing. I'd say it's it's more than that. We focus on. Um, companies that are around, I like to say our sweet spot is a company with a couple of thousand employees um, in discrete manufacturing. Our customer base actually goes from companies with probably 50 employees up to 25,000, but our sweet spot is those sort of medium size um, companies. And so most of these, these companies that we've selected here fall very much into that bucket of our target um, sweet spot. So how did we get here? Um, and Ty mentioned some of this um, previously, the uh, economic pressures, you know, the crash of 2009-2010, it was challenging for everybody, right? I mean, it's particularly, you know, most of our customer base is in automotive. I think, I think outside of banking, automotive suffered the most. And the, the, the shock wave of that was that people we found were trying to eliminate every um, discretionary cost. They focused on everything they were spending. It was um, the, the blinkers and the, the laser focus on spending really came on. And every um, you know purchase order was scrutinized heavily. And I think it also made what I saw as well, it also made people start to question the entire engagement between a software vendor and a manufacturing company and if this is something that I've never quite understood in the years that I've been in this business and something I've had some big arguments about but example we sell you some software I'll keep the numbers round to keep the, the math simple I sell you some software $100,000, you give me this purchase order, I send you an invoice, you give me the money and then the next three, four, five years you send me 20% of that for maintenance. You know, I get your purchase order on day one, happy days, right, job done, we're, we're out of here, right, I've done my job, I've sold you the software, you on the other hand are going, I've just spent this hundred thousand dollars, how am I going to get my return on investment? Your reaction to that event is completely the opposite to my reaction to that event, right? I've got 80%, 90% of the money that I'm ever going to get out of you in that moment. You on the other hand have no clear visibility of any return on investment for probably years, if ever. 
I mean, you hear these horror stories about PLM deployments, um, ERP deployments. I mean, the money that people spend on SAP deployments, for instance, and it can be decades before they get their money back. You know, you look at the, and it's in the press, the Jaguar Land Rover situation at the moment. You know, they, they've spent tens of millions of dollars on um, Inovia deployment. They've got hundreds of people working on it. And they've just sat, you know, and after four or five years, they've said, that's it, we're not going to see the end of the day on this one. We're going to cut our losses and start to roll back. So finance people on your side of the fence have started to say, hang on a minute, you guys, you software people, need to have more skin in the game. Why should we bear all the risk on getting a return on investment? And so um, over the last five, six years, we have completely changed our pricing model. And so these days, instead of selling you licenses, we nearly always now lease you the license. You know, we rent it to you. So if we don't perform, you just stop paying us, basically. So it puts far more pressure on us to deliver and make sure you are actually getting the business value from our software that we, you know, that the salesman told you up front. You know, it's keeping everybody honest, I think. And this is something for me that should have happened 15, 20 years ago. And I've never really understood why you guys, that side of the fence, you know, were prepared to take the risk, but it's just history. It was the way it was always done, and so on and so forth. But we've seen a massive change how you engage with us and how we engage with you over the last four or five years, for sure. And I think it's good. I think it's healthy on both sides of the fence. Uh, it's something that I, I've really welcomed. And then on the technology side, um, there's just been, you know, let, let's face it, I, you know, I, I've been in this business a long time, and I honestly don't think the rate of change has, any, has been as great now as it's, it's, it's greater now than it's ever been. You know, things are changing so fast. You know, everything is connected. You know, Industry 4.0, countries are investing millions of, of dollars in, in making this, moving this forward. And, you know, the amount of data that's being produced is just ridiculous. I mean, you can buy a smart hairbrush now, for crying out loud. It actually gives you feedback on how many strokes you've made and whether you're pressing your scalp too much. And it's an app on your phone, so you can check this out. I tried it. It doesn't work for me. For those people online who can't see me, I have no hair, so that was a bit of a joke, right? So, but it is, it's just exploding, right? And how do we make use of this? And this is also impacting, you know, the worker skill mix as well. So this is how I see it. Manufacturing companies are having these um, pressures, and I, I think I should have put the arrows going the other way, uh, as opposed to pulling the companies apart, but you've got the complexity issue, the data issue, and the people issue. And I'll sort of break these down into these three elements as we go through the presentation, as I said, and interject that with demonstrations as well of, what's, of how people are solving some of these problems. So first up is the, the people issue. I don't want to start talking about politics, because certainly in the US at the moment it's a hot topic, but as the foreigner who's not allowed to uh, vote, I'm going to talk about American politics. I found, I found it really intriguing, amusing, odd, that there was a lot of debate about bringing jobs back to the Rust Belt, and particularly manufacturing you know, in this region, Wisconsin, et cetera, et cetera. And I asked this question at the last time I gave this presentation. How many people in this room have actually got open headcount and they're looking for people? Okay, so a few, probably 50%. The last time I asked the question was only a few months ago down in Atlanta at the Plex ERP event. You know, just about everybody in the room put their hand up. This is from the um, US Bureau of Labor Statistics. Number of job openings actually hires. It's not about the number of jobs, it's about the right people to fill them. And people are really struggling to find those those people. And in my opinion, there's six major 
elements on why this is happening. And the first three are education, education and education. The US are not producing enough engineering graduates. It's as simple as that. Russia produces twice as much, twice as many engineering grads as does the US with half the population. And the thing is, if you've got an engineering degree coming out of an American university, you can go into pretty much any industry. You know, it shows that you're smart, you're analytical, you're a good problem solver. You don't have to go into an engineering company. And these are some of the other reasons why there's this, this gap that's opening up. And this is a major, major problem because if you just take manufact US manufacturing by itself, it's actually would, it works out that it would actually be the ninth biggest global economy. So this is, you know, US manufacturing is, is absolutely huge. Now some of the other reasons why um, people don't go into engineering, because they get an engineering degree, as I said, they can go to other industries. You know, one of the things is, it's not sexy, right? Manufacturing, civil engineering, it's just not sexy. And people that are leaving university that have choices, I could ask this question as well. I mean, when you pull up to your car park in the mornings um, at, at your office, you know, how many Ferraris in the car park, right? You don't see Ferraris in manufacturing company car parks, but in uh, banking, insurance, software, if you get into a good startup, you know, you've got the chance of, you know, knocking it out of the ballpark, right? So engineering grades are looking at other alternative um, opportunities, basically. Now, one of the other things is, um, and this is some interesting research, millennials don't actually like coming to the office every day. Now, with manufacturing, you know, you're making something that's physical, you have to pick it up and touch it basically, right? You have to see it, you have to, you know, interact with it, which means you have to be there physically. And millennials don't actually like racking up at the office each day. For, for us, as a software company, it's not such a bad, you know, we can cope with that. Nearly everybody in my organization, without, with one exception, we have one person that always goes to the office every day who's a developer in San Francisco. Everybody else will work from home one, two, three days a week. And we can give them that flexibility. You, on the other hand, you can't do that. And that's another reason why um, manufacturing companies are struggling. And the other thing is that, you know, this, this isn't going to get any better this this graph most of um, most people think that US manufacturing will continue to grow aggressively over the next decade and will will most of the numbers tend to suggest that there'll be a, an approximately another three million jobs in US manufacturing in 10 years time the problem is that if this continues and even if you can sort of flatten this graph off a little bit the estimate is there's going to be a shortfall of nearly 2 million people. And if we look back the last 30 years, every decade, US manufacturing has roughly increased its output by 100%. Now, to remain competitive with you know, foreign nations, the US are not going to be able to compete on on price, right? It's got to be on innovation and efficiency. And the biggest thing is, how can you keep that going, that 100% that increase every 10 years, if you haven't got the right bodies to do it? And this is going to be a major problem. This is just going to be a huge problem to the growth of the US manufacturing industry. And, you know, this is another interesting stat I find, that 70% of all engineering PhDs that are leaving US universities are not American, they're, you know, they're, they're foreigners basically, and not so many are staying anymore. So this again is a huge problem. So what does this all mean? You know, why am I rambling on about this and about jobs, etc.? What it means is this is a scarce resource. Engineering talent 
is a massively scarce resource in US manufacturing companies and pretty much every account I go into and in fact we were just talking about it earlier on um, we go into meetings and there'll be a guy my age who's just coming up for retirement and then a group of 20 somethings and nothing in the middle you cannot afford, you cannot afford to have smart engineering folks doing mundane jobs. Like, I need to find out the price of this component, it's in Charlie's spreadsheet and I get, need to go and talk to Charlie to get that information. Or it's in the CAD system, I need to go and interrupt Fred so he can open up that model so I can get some measurements out of it, right? I can't have somebody going, the example Ty gave. GD&T call-outs, tolerancing information. I can't afford to have a skilled engineer writing down this is a, a, a run-out tolerance of 0 0.06 against these two datums, etc., etc. If somebody's already done that in the CAD system, right? But as he said, as Ty said, you know, if you make one tiny error on a GD&T call-out, you know, you could completely screw the whole manufacturing process. Companies have got to get away from the fact of having smart people doing dumb jobs, basically. And often, you know, with when you've got engineering, manufacturing data, you need somebody with some smarts to look at it and analyze it and use it, right? So the whole thing is you've got to automate the routine. And this is one of this was one of our driving principles when we actually started to develop the product four years ago, five years ago in fact. It was how do we take away some of that grunt and some of that that mundane work that people are doing in engineering companies and make it easier for people to see data and use data and have the system in the background mash the data together to give you insights and dashboards and so on and so forth rather than printing out 10 different Excel spreadsheets, having them spread across your desk and you're standing there looking at, now that bit goes with that cell there and trying to join the dots in your head, right? Which is typically what happens today. And this was one of our fundamental drivers behind developing the software in the first place. And, you know, Ty mentioned the whole, and this was a non-trivial problem. And I think we're the experts in this because I can tell you we made lots of mistakes. We launched this product three times before we got it right. And the first three incarnations, quite frankly, just didn't work. Didn't work well enough. We couldn't expand, wasn't flexible enough, and so on and so forth. Fortunately now we've got it right and you know companies are out there using it, etc. But this was this is one of our key drivers on the business problem and how did we solve it. So what we're going to do in the first demonstration is just sort of give you a general overview of the product, how it works, give you some insight. The second one will be a very collaborative demonstration and then the third one is how somebody has tweaked the system to suit their environment. Um, one of the other things that we've been passionate about um, in in Actify is that we've made the system, I'm going to say tweakable, so that we don't upset your work, your processes. I find that um, many small to medium companies survive because they're agile and their processes are super slick and clever. You know, we have companies that turn around stuff so fast, it's ridiculous. Um, but a lot of the systems that were in the marketplace already, and we looked at a lot of them, you know, and I've got a lot of background in PLM and CAD, etc. Make you change your process to suit the software. And for us, that is just, that shouldn't be the case. Um, in, in a previous life, I used to be a um, management consultant. You know, I was the guy that came in and said, let me have a look at your watch and I'll tell you what the time is, you know. Um, but I did a lot of work in, in the Far East, in Japan. But, and I was going out there a lot, did a lot of work with Mazda and a lot of work with Seiko. And to a Westerner, I struggled to work out why they were so damn efficient. 
and why were they so good at what they did and how they could turn around things so quickly and I was there I was in Seiko for nearly three months had my own um, translator and would go around and I, I was interviewing management and people on the shop floor and it was just doing my head in on I couldn't work out why they were so damn good and then one morning never forget it I'm in the shower and I thought it's the process it's all about their processes. They had no smart software. It was all about the processes. And I realized that from that day onwards, that software should be an enabler to help you perform your processes as opposed to you need to change your processes to suit my software. And this is something that we have been passionate about in, in Actify, to try and make this as open, as flexible as possible, so that you don't have to change what you're doing and we can conform to what you know uh, you're doing already. So. This is the um, a typical view of um, the catalog. Here you can see um, the assembly structure over on the, um, the right hand side and this is being sucked in from the, um, the CAD system. Again, one of the things that we've tried to do with Centro is you've already got all this information. You don't want to be having to type it back in etc into the system right so we have this concept of a pipeline and it's like a, a vacuum cleaner for data it will just go to your existing repository if that's a folder structure or if it's some other system suck out the bits of information that it's needed I, I like to think of, of it as a, a a workflow engine but for information as opposed to you know a process so one of the things that this pipeline has done is that it's taken the CAD file and it's brought in the um, assembly structure over here on the left but it's also done all these other things to that CAD file it's extracted the spin fire file, a PDF file, a step file, spin fire web file, a thumbnail in the background it's also extracted physical information um, volume, surface area and so on and so forth so all totally automated you don't have to have somebody creating step files okay which I know a lot of companies do or JT files so they can send that to a supplier this will just do it all, all, automatically <clears throat> the other thing that it's doing is this is this tab here called a data doc and this is a clever spreadsheet right it's a smart spreadsheet it gets populated by other information again you have out there in your on your network it could be in many cases for small to medium companies it's Excel spreadsheets right and in fact even for some you know much bigger organizations that we've been into um, I won't mention by name because it's just truly embarrassing but we've got one customer that is a household name a world-class manufacturing company they gave us half a dozen databases to suck information from one of those data sources was an Excel spreadsheet that was sixteen and a half thousand rows by three and a half thousand columns yeah it, and I'm not joking if that had become corrupt they would have stopped producing it you know that's the sort of stuff so anyway this information is being populated by a different pipeline that's grabbing that information and populating these data docs. Now, what you can do with that is if Jim goes to that dashboard up the top here, <clears throat> as Jim hovers over these different concentric circles, you can see this updates with the um, pricing and etc. and the size of the, the circle. Um, gives you the, an idea of the pricing and if he clicks on it it will take him to that particular thing um, so one of our customers is using this as um, in their quoting process to see what prices they used previously basically you know this is an example of a dashboard once the information is in that graph database we can cut slice dice and present it back to you any any way that you want personally I actually don't like this dashboard but you know it's what the customer wanted and we're trying to listen to the customer so that's what they got now the other thing that you saw in the the resource um, folder uh, folder area I've got to stop calling them folders um, is this area here this was information that the CAD file um, produced but down here you've also got supporting documentation so we call these categories so 
this bucket, if you will, is the is the um, the catalog part, and then within that you have categories, and you can have as many categories as you want, and that can contain any type of information you want. So it could be it's not only about CAD; it's also about all that related metadata, you know, engineering docs, FEMA information. Um, and so on and so Excel spreadsheets etc etc one place to go to find all the information that's related and you'll also see if we go down to the the CAD files again I noticed there was a good example um, in the CAD file uh, area it keeps all the versions that relate to each one so version 2 version 5 etc etc so as version control check in check out that Jim will show you in the collaboration demonstration a, a little bit later so the other thing that, that all, the pipeline automatically did was create what we call a Spinfire web file. Spinfire web is a lightweight viewer that you can use on um, any, through any browser, basically. So if somebody's traveling, they don't need access to the actual server. As so long as they've got access to the web, they can pull up a, uh, a view. And it will do things like explode the assembly, we can do cross sections, Jim will show you um, some measurements and so on and so forth. So it's not as powerful as the Spinfire client, it cannot do some of the analysis things like thickness analysis, curvature analysis, draft angle analysis. But if somebody just wants to see what the thing looks like, take some measurements, do a cross section, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, then this is, this is great, right? And on the left here, you've also got, again, it brings across the um, assembly structure, as you saw um, in, in catalog as well. And if the CAD system, if the CAD designer has added any CAD views, and we find this is particularly true when you've got lots of GD&T and tolerancing information, so that it makes the uh, reading of those tolerancing information easier, then the system automatically brings that through, and people can see that in the in the CAD uh, in the CAD viewer. Um, sorry, in the Spinfire web viewer as well. Now, this on the the right hand side is pretty damn interesting. So, Jim's pulled that out, and this is your metadata. So, any metadata that's in the CAD file uh, in the in the system, in our database that we've sucked from multiple different data sources. This could be CAD information, costing information that's come from the ERP system, facility information that's come from uh, you know, perhaps a facility database, warranty information, anything you want. Jim just goes through, clicks on that, and then you've got this information here available to you. Okay, and if you just take um, look at something here, let's focus on the engineer for instance, R. Henry and Jim clicks on a different component, it'll update when Jim's finished taking measurements. My filter's disappeared. All right, okay, it's now jump to M. Smith. So as you click through the different components, the metadata that's associated with that component will automatically update, okay? And as Ty mentioned earlier, this is running over a distributed architecture. So if you have a facility in in the US and one in China, you know you'll still see all this information, no matter where it's where it's coming from, right? And so we have customers that are using this, you know, extensively now to be able to view information you know we started off as a viewing company and many new guards are still regard us as a viewing company we allow you to view information that is already in all these different silos you've got right it's a good point that time made you know we're not trying to replace your ERP system we're not trying to replace your PLM system I mean if you haven't got a PLM system we can certainly fulfill a lot of your requirements but all those other systems you've got then we can uh, get access to that information and present it in an easy to understand way. I mean, because, you know, the concept of an enterprise wide PLM, syst PLM system, purely from a techno technological perspective, of it being one piece of software, I think is quite frankly 
ludicrous, right? I hate to say this, but people like Dassault, Siemens, PTC, Oracle, the list is endless, market the concept of a, an enterprise-wide PLM system, right? I've been dealing with PLM systems for, we worked it out the other day, and it's a scary number, for the last 35 years I've been involved in this industry. I don't know anybody anywhere, not one company that has successfully deployed an enterprise-wide PLM system. You always have multiple different data sources. You know, let's just take the, the basics. If you've got a PLM system or a PDM system, and you've got an ERP system, well, there's two major databases, right? How do you see that information that's in both systems? Because as a company, you cannot afford to buy a license for everybody. And not only that, the things are too damn complex. If I'm working in the ERP system every day and then I suddenly switch over to a PLM system, what the hell am I looking at? Even if it's from the same vendor like SAP, for instance, it's still too challenging. It just doesn't work. So this is why we've developed this system for somebody, a casual user in particular, to be able to view information from anywhere, wherever they are, through these browsers. <coughs> So the other cool thing that we have um, is this ability to um, find duplicates or similars. And our definition of a duplicate is something that is um, a physical object that is exactly the same geometric shape as another component in your database, but under a different part name. So a good example, we had one customer where we found one object, and for those online, I'm holding up a glass, um, that was exactly the same shape, but when we looked at the metadata, it was actually five different materials. In fact, it was five different grades of mild steel. So you know, instantly there's some saving, and, and as Ty said, you know, typically we see between 10 and 20 percent duplicates in people's databases. We've never found anybody less than 7 percent, and the cost of carrying a duplicate is is significant. And not only from so the system, as a, you know, a CAD file touches the system. As I mentioned earlier, pipeline was doing that conversion to SAP, creating a Spinfire file, a Spinfire web file, extracting metadata, putting it into catalog. The other thing it does is give the component a shape indices. And it, it will automatically compare that shape indices to other shape in indices in the database. And if it sees a duplicate, it will automatically flag that this thing has, in this case, six duplicates, all with subtly different um, names, as you, can, as you can see here. And the other cool thing is, Jim, do you want to do a, a compare or, or find similars? <clears throat> see, here you've got the opportunity to also find similar shapes. So it starts off, obviously, with the duplicates, but then you can see this, this bearing is subtly different from that bearing, is subtly different from that one. So it's a bit like a Google search. The further you go down the list, the, the less similar th that it gets. And we'll talk about this in a bit more detail later, but you can imagine for a quoting department, for instance, have I manufactured anything that looks vaguely like this before? If so, where did, did we buy it? Did we manufacture it? If we manufactured it, where did we, where did we manufacture it? If what's the facility, right? Who was the engineer? Is he still with us? Have I still got the tooling? What did we quote for this last time? You know, did we make any money on it? Right? And all that information is in the database, and this is how we, we, we can um, find it. And what Jim can do, it's just like a shopping website, right? Jim can simply tick on the things that he's interested in and do a compare. It hits the compare button, and that, that information that you saw earlier that was in the data grid, and that was the information we pulled from the right-hand side of the Spinfire web view, that data grid, all that information is also available here. And you can see you can pull up the material information, quote price information, in this case was 351, 599, 34. So exactly the same 
component, but on the three times that you actually quoted on this, you quoted different prices, and then obviously why. As a great um, user story, we had one customer that did exactly the same as Jim's doing here on their database, but it was a purchased component. They bought this same thing from the same supplier 10 times, and on each time it was a different price. And you know, some of it was understandable, lead times were shortened, they needed it quicker, etc. But a lot of the times there was no explanation. So I can imagine it was an interesting phone call with their purchasing to the supplier, you know, what the hell are you doing and why are we paying different prices all the time? But if you haven't got a tool like this, how do you join those dots together and make those decisions? Right, so the whole concept and the idea behind the, the product is to give you the information that, so that you can make smarter, faster, more informed decisions because you've got all this information at your fingertips, right? Any questions in the room at the moment? Jay. Okay, so I've, I've got to do this, right? So the question from the floor is, um, does the how does Actifier get the information that's already existing in other areas of the system or other databases into the um, into the catalog, and do it, does it have to be stored in a particular format or particular structure? Right. Okay. Got that. So that's the question. Um, so the answer is. Um, it depends where your files are stored, right? So the simple um, case is that I'm going to say in a lot of um, tier one, tier automotive supplies, those small to medium companies, probably 65% of our install base do not have a PDM system. Okay, so their files are stored in some massively complex folder structure, and it's the discipline of the engineer to make sure that it goes in the right element, right? Um, I don't know what, if that's the case at, at your company, Jay, or not. Uh, yeah. Okay, so the pipeline has the ability um, to basically pass through that assembly structure and pull that information into catalog. Um, and you can set certain parameters on the pipelines that will keep certain parameters um, that you need into the catalog. So we had a question earlier that was um, uh, Jeff here um, wants to keep the the naming convention he has on his folder structure that he wants that as the naming convention in the catalog whether well, the pipeline can can do that for you or it could take the name of the CAD file as the um, catalog part or you could actually define something else that you make up I want this Ford F-150 2020 model year to be called Fred in the catalogue, right? You could do that as well. So basically we've made it very flexible that you can suck in that information as, as you know, and view it in the way that you want. Um, other people that have a PDM system, you know, typically they want to keep the naming convention and the, um, the structure the same as the PDM system and pull it in. Or other people, if it's an ERP system that they consider, you know, we've got quite a few Plex customers, and um, certainly around here in the Michigan area, where the ERP system is the the system of record, basically. So we, we grab that naming convention and use it in catalog. The other smart thing that the pipeline can do, so pipelines can be very simple. They can simply say, take a CAD file out of a folder structure, and put it in catalog and make a thumbnail. Right, job done. That's it. Pipelines can also be massively sophisticated, and we even have things like if statements. And pipelines can talk to other pipelines that call other things. So, just to give you another example of what a pipeline can do, and I'm going a little bit off topic from the question, but we have one customer that has um, a very simple business rule: if the price of the raw material of the component goes above 30% of the quote price. Sorry, we just have some questions here. So okay, um, if it goes above 30% of the quote price, they start to lose profit margin. So what happens today is, is that CAD 
guy stores that component, a pipeline will grab it, rip all that information from it, get the volume, go to the quoting system, get the quote price, go to a commodities database and get the, the price. Do an if statement, if it goes back, send an email to the COO in that case to say you've got a problem using money on this. So we've tried to make those pipelines as um, flexible as possible so that you can pretty much replicate the structures that you've currently got so that we don't, so people haven't got to relearn basically. You know, I, I went on a lot earlier about not changing your process, but we also don't want to change your naming convention to suit, right? possible to connect Centro with our in-house custom-built FDEs? Um, so we've had this one a couple of times, a custom-built internal um, systems and we've tried to make our system as open as possible so if they've made this and it's custom-built as open as possible and typically with um, companies that have custom built solutions and we're dealing with one in China at the moment they have good expertise in house because they built it right so typically we can find a way of getting the information in and out of that system uh, next one we also have Good question. So, in fact, we've got two examples going on right now. One company has, has their information stored in SharePoint, uh, most of their CAD files. I won't make any comment because they might be able to be on the webinar. Um, so, we're actually pulling that information out of SharePoint and putting it into catalog or pointing. So we've got that ability, and yeah, we could certainly push information into a SharePoint site as well. So that was that's the answer to that one. Um, sorry, yeah. So sorry, the answer that I just gave was to a question of, can we pull and push information to and from SharePoint? Um, next question: Is there any central pull data from external sources such as Fireplace? Yeah, absolutely. So the whole idea behind, so the question was, can we pull and push information from other data sources? The whole concept behind the product is exactly, exactly what we're doing. Here's another example. We've got one customer that actually doesn't have any users of catalog. They don't see what you've just seen ever. What they're using the system for, the pipelines for, is to grab the GD&T callouts from the CAD file and the BOM structure from the CAD file and automatically populate the ERP system. They've taken out all that manual process, they're saving people power by doing that and the system's just doing that automatically. But right now, they don't actually have any users per se of the catalog. Now the, the thought process is they will downstream, but they're first, give me some value from the system out the box, that's exactly what they wanted to do. Take the information from CAD, put it straight into ERP so nobody has to touch it. Good, so that's the end of the questions. Um, so, moving on with the presentation before I hand over to Jim again. And uh, how, long, how am I doing on time? Okay, fine, we're good, we're good. So, complexity. And I was talking to some people over coffee about this. Um, the complexity of products is just exploding, right? Um, the the example I love to give is is one of the um, our customers, one of the Magna divisions. Um, they make bumpers. Do you call them bumpers? Fenders. And. Ten years ago, this was just a big bit of plastic, right? Today, it's a big bit of plastic, but now it's got a reversing camera in it, it's got reversing sensors, it's got lane deviation sensors, it's a big bit of plastic with a zillion pieces of, of electronics and other information in it. I play golf with a guy that's a medical rep salesperson, right? This you know, I'm in manufacturing industry, I, I, this, but this just blew me away as well. One of his 
repeat orders is sponges you know the sponge that the surgeon uses in the theater what do you guys call it operating room is it an operating room operating room you don't call them a theater um, so uh, that they they you know when they're doing um, surgery that they use the sponge to stoke up the blood right it's a sponge for crying out loud his biggest seller is a sponge with a chip in it it's got a GPS tracking system in it the argument being is if they leave one inside they know where it is and they can recover it but right so I got that bit but the real wow was they now know how long the sponge has been sat in the operating room they also know what surgeons use more sponges than other surgeons which I really found fascinating. So this whole thing about you know big data, it's not just in. It used to be, you know, aero engines could tell, you know, forewarn or maintenance issues or you know large um, assemblies and complex assemblies. But it's a sponge for crying out loud. Yeah, you know, it's two components: the sponge and the chip. But that is what I'm talking about when it comes to the, this explosion of complexity and data, which is, I think, the next the next subject. Here's the thing with manufacturing, right? This 2.4 quintillion bytes of data and a quintillion is um, one with 18 zeros behind it. We're producing that a day. And actually, this stat is four years old, so it's almost certainly gone up by the considerably since 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 this since IBM um, published this this number. And the other just scary thing is that 80 to 85 percent of all digital information has been produced in the last two years. You know, we've got theatres, sorry, operating room sponges producing masses amount of data you know autonomous cars are going to produce a gigabyte of information per second for crying out loud now the thing is with manufacturing companies manufacturing companies are so far behind the curve it's, it's embarrassing manufacturing companies are just not using the information it's often being produced by their very own products now across all industries most of the, the, the research that I've read suggests that 10% of information is being actually collated and used. Manufacturing, the number's less than 2%. So only 1%, let's say it's 1%, only 1% of this information is actually being used. And the examples from other, other industries are just, you know, scary. Um, Amazon, between 30 and 60 percent increase in spend on an Amazon website comes because of their recommendations that they put at the bottom of the screen right which is massive there's a there's a supermarket chain grocery store in England Tesco's they are testing out um, trolleys where you swipe your um, you know, shopping cart um, I'll get the English right in a minute. They swipe the um, your loyalty card, and it knows who you are, what your spend is, and where you are in the store. So as you're walking down the aisle, if you're a young mum, for instance, you go down the baby aisle, it will flash up offers of, they're not called nappies, are they? What are they called in them? Diapers. It will flash up offers on diapers, you know, buy to get one free for instance you know if it's me it would flash up you're going past the red wine this bottle of Bordeaux you can get 15% off right? I don't know any manufacturing companies that are even close to doing anything like this yet but if you're going to remain competitive surely we've got to start using the data that's already we've already got that are in all these different databases we've got to start using it smarter we've got to start pulling it together getting better insight because otherwise you know somebody will do it and we'll start making working out how to use this information this data to make better smart business decisions so it's, it's absolutely key that manufacturing companies you know start to get on this this gig basically
and companies, not companies, countries are really taking this massively seriously. So we've gone through these, you know, four generations, steam power back in the day, um, assembly lines and electricity was the second generation. Um, the first assembly line was um, a slaughterhouse in the Midlands in England um, back in the, the end of the uh, 1800s. And then Henry Ford, obviously famously 1913, if I remember my dates correctly, was the first person to actually install a moving um, assembly line and reduce the the time it took to put a car together by you know uh, a zillion percent. Then we got to you know um, controllers and computerization here, and now we're into the cyber physical systems, the Internet of Things connected to the internet. And just to give you an idea of of how. Um, countries are responding to this. Angela Merkel gave a fascinating presentation at um, Switzerland. Davos, thank you. The Davos conference um, in Switzerland this year. Um, they, Germany are investing 200 million euros in grant money to companies in research development on how to better use this the Internet of Things connected to the um, internet so that the German country can remain competitive with the rest of the world. Um, Korea, the good side of Korea, not the bad side of Korea, have also invested a similar amount of money to get their manufacturing companies up to snuff. And this is something that is just going to become more and more prevalent going forward. And if com manufacturing companies don't have some sort of um, data strategy, it's going to hurt you. Because even right now, you know, the, the problems that um, we're solving with Centro and the ability to see all this information, that is just going to ramp up more and more. We've actually got one company that's now currently looking at how they can get all of their information from their sensors on the shop floor into catalogs so they can start mashing that information up together with the design information to make better design decisions etc cetera, etc cetera. so this is something else that is just going to you know really take off and we're seeing more and more people invested in you know smart factories i mean the, probably the best example is tesla have just in, invested zillions in trying to increase their throughput in california with this mega factory as it's called right and being from california you probably know more about it than i do so this is again something that's just going to increase the amount of information and you know the whole internet of things is just as i said before exploding smart hair brushes smart operating room um, sponges pretty much everything now has got a chip in it that's going to give you feedback and again it's a question of how you use that information to move forward and make better decisions <clears throat> here's the thing with business intelligence business intelligence is is becoming omnipresent in in a lot of industries but there's clearly a, um, a delay manufacturing companies are behind other industries when it comes to the business intelligence and it's not and it's it's easy to understand why right because manufacturing companies have some pretty pretty unique data sources I mean the easy example is CAD right 3d CAD information it's a lot harder to get that information out of a CAD system to be able to use it somewhere else and mash it together with other information than it is a couple of Excel spreadsheets or a couple of SQL databases, right? So it's only now that I believe that manufacturing companies are starting to see the tools, ours being one of them, that can actually use the information that you've got in your, let's call them unusual data sources and the 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 complexity and the breadth of these data sources is probably 
greater in a manufacturing company than any other type of company in out there, basically, in my opinion. I mean, some chemists might argue differently, but I still think that manufacturing information, you know, just you've got the CAD, you've got the finite element analysis, you've got you know, material databases, you've got warranty databases, and you've got some more traditional stuff like ERP, finance, customer uh, databases. But bringing all that together to be able to see that information is clearly a big, big challenge for manufacturing companies. And to be able to produce dashboards and things that actually make some sense of that is is a, another layer of complexity that other um, other um, industries you know just don't suffer with so looking at this problem in a different way you've got low visibility from data manual and manual data collection reports meetings etc and then you've got all these enterprise solutions you know that Ty touched on earlier and I've been rambling on about as well PLM uh, PDM systems test information Excel ERP quality etc 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 so you've got individual users that are accessing these pieces of these different applications. You've also got all this ad hoc stuff going on at, at the top there. And what we have done basically is try and pull all this information together and make everything available from, from, from one location. And it can be simple stuff as well, but still has a big impact. So we've got one customer that has weekly design reviews. Pretty damn typical, right, in manufacturing companies. Everybody gets in the same room and discuss where they are in the project. And this, this particular product was um, relatively complex. They had half a dozen different team leads that were doing different elements of the, the product. And they would have a design review manager that would walk around to each individual team lead and say, where are you? How's it going? How finished are you? You know? any major roadblocks, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the Friday, they would have the design review meeting. And on the following Monday, they would have the design review meeting with management. And that was their process. They invited us in and said, right, we don't think we're getting a good view of progress by talking to the these team leads, right? And it's a bit like when I asked Ty for a sales forecast. You know, there's an element of guesswork, right? And there's also an element of personality in giving that number. You know, some people are optimistic, some people are pessimistic, right? So they'd go around to the design managers and some guy would say, I'm 80% done. Somebody else would say they're 50% done, but if you swapped them over, you'd probably still get the similar answer. So we're getting conflicting information, right? So we did this project, took us about six, seven weeks. They got this dashboard and it showed them exactly where they were from half a dozen different data sources. It was um, uh, CATIA, DMU, there was a, an issues database, there was a... Um, uh, uh, another database I can't, and there was also some spreadsheets we started to pull all this together and the interesting thing was as they were coming up to a design gate that was important everything started to turn green as soon as the meeting was finished with senior management it all went red again because basically they was just bullshitting management and exactly where they were and management then had to get them all in a room and say, look, guys, we actually now know where you are. We're getting this empirical data. It's not based on guesswork anymore. We can see what's going on. You know, stop bullshitting us. We can see it on a dashboard. Let's focus in on the areas. Why is this particular thing gone red? Right? Why is it red? Can we drill down? And their design reviews completely changed. Because the other thing was that obviously by the time they had the meeting on the Monday, most of that information was out of date anyway, and it changed. And a lot of the, the issues were, oh, yeah, we've already fixed that and moved on. So now what, they, what happened, it completely changed the way they started to do work. It completely changed because those meetings now could focus on what was wrong where the bottlenecks were. That's right, the issues database, I remember now, had some business rules. So there was some 
weighting applied to an issue. So if it was a big issue, it went very red, and if it was only a minor issue, it was just a pale pink, basically. So they could instantly see where the problem was in their process and what were the the components and assemblies that were really giving them a big issue, and they could change that whole design review philosophy and focus in on the areas of, of concern. And in fact, in the third demonstration that we give you, you'll actually see one of those dashboards that does pull information together from different data sources and actually changes some things to um, red if there's a major problem. So, Jim. So, with that, demonstration number two. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, Jim Vassello. Um, I'd like to show you some a demonstration on the collaboration aspect of of our products. Um, so, what we've seen so far is a lot of the the webinar based um, via Centro. Uh, a lot of information being pulled in from from other sources to populate the Centro database. Being able to log in and look at information. Um, one of the other things that we can do, and this is based on the fact that even though accessing the information from catalog does not require folders, there may be virtual folders or information that you can retrieve without folders, people's minds are set on folders. Where do you store things? You store them in folders. Um, that's just the nature of using Windows over all these 30 some odd years. Did they have Windows back then? I don't know if they did. Um, so one of the things that we've we've added was the ability to use a folder structure to interact with the central database to pull information to check out and check in information to make it easier for those who like sticking with the folder structure to access that same data um, so as an example uh, I have this ability to link to a project in the central database wherever that happens to be it could be in in Detroit it could be in China it doesn't matter where it is if I have the web access to it I, pardon me I can get access to it so in this case I'm going to do a search for the combustion unit because that's the one we've been working on and I want to download from the database uh, thumbnail and the spinfire file so what that does is it creates like a virtual folder right within Windows Explorer here that I can come in and now I see those files. So let's say I have the Spinfire file and again we're collaboration. I want to be able to um, check out that file so I can right click and just say well I'm going to check out this file. I automatically if you look at the bottom right corner I see a Windows alert that the file's been checked out. I also see that it's locked for the user I'm logged in as, Windows user, because the user who checked that out, different user. So obviously if I check it out, I don't want anybody else to be able to check it in. It's locked. Okay, so it's an automatic thing. So I could have somebody logged on um, from China and I happen to check out that file from where I'm located here. He automatically sees that it's locked somebody's using it he can't unlock that um, so I have that locked out and I'm just going to open up that in Spinfire because I want to be able to add some information to this to collaborate with other people to upload that back to the the, the web version central catalog yes yes it is good question your name sir so, so the question was, um, can I also check out from catalog other information? Again, being that's locked here, I can't check that out. However, if I want the 3D PDF file or I want to spin the, uh, the CAD file, I certainly can check that out. And if I want, I could download that locally maybe from China over to my laptop here to check it out or I just want to check it out so somebody else can't check it out themselves yeah no worries. so now I have the spinfire file open and um, 
one of the things I wanted to show in, in, in the collaboration is the, the ability to add something new in, in Spinfire 11.6, um, rule-based analysis. So I'm just going to go ahead and create a new user V here because I'm going to be I'll be using those, and I'm going to go ahead and just do a quick explode assembly. Um, basically, the same type of explode assembly that we saw in in catalog in Spinfire Web, and I'll create a view here as well. And now let's say I have I, I want to find out what components are of the same volume. Okay, so if I take a quick look at, at one of them, I can take a look at the volume. It's about 2.13 cubic inches. Okay, so what I want to do is go to my rule based coloring or analysis and say that any existing, I want it to be blue or green that I found, um, anything that does not match, I want it to be red. And what I mean by match is I'm going to analyze the physical volume compared to other um, volumes and I want to go greater than or equal to let's say 2 and they also want to go um, less than or equal to an another value so I'll go back with um, less than or equal to 3 so I want to see what components are between 2 and 3 cubic inches in volume. So when I analyze that, it comes back with everything in green, those components, are between those values that I keyed in. Now imagine if you're a Spinfire user and I wanted to find out, are all those components in the same volume aspect? Well, you'd right click, calculate volume. This gives me the ability, in, in this case, to just search between the two values, or I can get it even closer to get uh, closer results. So what I can also do is export that information to an Excel spreadsheet, and I'll just key in volume results here, and export. So I'm going to go ahead and close this, and I will save this file. Okay, so now what I have in that folder is this results file. And again, I'm going to collaborate, I'm going to share this back up into Central Catalog so everybody has access to this. So now I have this Excel spreadsheet. Okay, I have the match location and no match. So it tells me that what does not um, does not filter into that those results as well. But what I also want to do is, well, I want to add the a graphic to this because that's good and everything. But what it's what's it related to? I can't see what that's related to. So what I'm going to do is add the Spinfire file into the Excel spreadsheet using the Spinfire for Office integration. Again, we're, we're collaborating information here. Um, so instead of just a static, a static image in the spreadsheet, I'll add that Spinfire file into that so somebody else can open that up and maybe look at it at a later date. So we have the option here of inserting into Excel, and I'll go ahead and just do that and I can move it around later on because it's a static image. So um, so now I have that file in there and I'll close out the Spinfire here. So now I have this Spinfire or this just this image of it. Okay, and now if I double click, it will bring up and start Spinfire right within Excel. And this works Excel, PowerPoint, and, um, and Word. This saves with the file, so I'm going to save it and I'll send it back up into the web because I want other people to have access to it. That's yes. Question. Does each person who opens Excel need to have Spinfire seat in order to exercise this image like you're doing? 
Good question. So the question was, does anybody who opens this Excel spreadsheet have to have Spinfire installed either with or without a license? Um, the answer is they, they don't, but all they will see is that image. If they want to activate the Spinfire object embedded into it, they need Spinfire installed. If they have just Spinfire Reader, they can view that, kind of like Adobe Reader. You can view it, rotate it around, see whatever information is in there, any views or anything created. If they have Spinfire with a license, they can add additional markups to that well, that, that will then save um, with this. So if I look at, I have my explode assembly here and I have my different user views. Had I saved the rule-based coloring, that would have been there as well. Okay, so what I'm going to do is save this. So now remember, I have in catalog this file is locked. What I want to do is add that piece of information, add that Excel spreadsheet to catalog. Okay, so there's a Spinfire file. Um, I'll confirm that. Uh, no, come on now. There we are. Check in as, sorry, new resource. Excel file. So now it's taking that Excel file. Okay, so right now it's asking for a comment. You can force any check-in, any person checking in a document to add a comment. That way you know what's changed when it's checking. Why is there a version two? There's no comments there, okay? Um, so I'll just key in new uh, rule-based results. So I'll go ahead and check that in. So if I refresh the page, that should show that file right under here under undersigned. So what I'm going to do is move that resource over to um, supporting documentation. So now I have that new Excel spreadsheet. Okay. Um, this one I can go ahead and cancel because I'm not doing anything, so I'll cancel that checkout. And this one, I'm not sure why it's doing this. Um, oh, I didn't save it, that's why. Okay, if you don't save the file, you can't check it back in because nothing's changed. Okay, in that case, I didn't save the file. If I had, it would have given me a check-in capability. So I can, I can go ahead and, uh, and cancel that check-in or go ahead and edit, save it again, and, and check that in. Um, but what we have is the collaboration of the original set of data that was pipeline into Centro. Right? We have the original CAD file that was sent up into the Centro product so it could be accessed by anybody anywhere in the world who has access to that. It automatically generated all those files as Chris had mentioned before. We've added additional information in there. We downloaded the Spinfire file, created additional information, put it in an Excel spreadsheet, put that back up into Centro. Now what we have here is the different versioning of these. So if any one of them is checked out, saved and checked back in, you're going to get different versions. You can see the Spinfire file already has different versions here. That's been edited, checked out, edited, sent back in. Um, we have different results here. Okay, We have tags that we could add to that so you can search on tags. Um, the comments in there. So all this information again is pulling from different locations, different sources, putting it into one location that can be accessed by whoever happens to have login access and permission. If you don't have permission, you can't get here. Simple as that. There's a, there's a lot of permissions that we can block out um, whoever has access to that. So 
whatever data you want to share, whether it's through the pipeline, whether it's just uploading it manually, whether it's through the Central Connect product that links directly to the database, it's all now in one location. It's in the database, it's tracked, it's versioned, you have history on it. You can, you can export these projects into a set of data for backup if you need it later. For auditing purposes, a lot of customers use that for auditing. Well, why you have four four versions? Let go back to version one. What is that? Show me show me what the differences are. So for auditing purposes as well. Um, question. Yeah. So I can go in there. I can select the history, go into the version I want and download. Right. Good question. The question was, I don't know if I repeated it, um, the question was if I have multiple versions here, okay, here's the two versions, I may want to go back to the original version and download that, maybe for a comparison. Okay, so you can do that. Whatever version is there, it's not, it doesn't overwrite it, it puts it in history. Every file that has a version all the previous versions are, are stored in the database and can be retrieved. Yeah. Any questions um, from the uh, web conference? Any more questions out here? One more. In regards to distribution of that, when you download it, what happens? Does it get put into the CAD file? Is it just temporarily opened in like FinFire? What does that download do? Good, good question. So the question was, when I download, and I can go ahead and do that. I'll just download this this file here. Um, what happens is it downloads it to wherever your browser is set to download your files to. It downloads it local. So your username slash downloads or wherever you have that set to. Right. Exactly. Does it automatically open it when you download it? It depends on what your browser is set to. Okay. Yeah, if it is, it will. If not, you click it and it opens it up. Hi, uh, this is Chris Jones again. We're running behind schedule, so I'll try and make this last bit um, awfully quick. So a couple of examples, and then we could do a very short demo after this. So I've already spoken about this, the ability to take the GD&T callouts, as you can see here, directly into an um, ERP system. And this is exactly this example. This is uh, Plex ERP. For those that have got Plex, will recognise this. Here's the the GDNT callouts on the um, CAD file here, and you can see it auto populate the uh, inspection sheet within the ERP system. So the the quoting problem. This is a, an example. Um, we're not going to show some quoting sheets, but a lot of our customers are using the system to have a front end quote template that as they fill in information into the quote template it automatically populates the database and then going forward they've obviously got history of previous quotes that then they can reference that coupled with the 3d shape search when they get something new in from a you know from a OEM for instance that says you know I want to quote on one of these they can literally go do the shape search find if they've manufactured anything that's vaguely similar as you saw with Jim pulling up the similars and all that metadata and um, that obviously helps with repeat quotes more often very similar quotes because often an OEM will send you you know this model and then six months later it'll send you pretty much the same model but ask you to re-quote so if you've got that historical information you can simply reference it now this um, it's what typically happens and you know we find that most of our customers quote on average about a thousand quotes a year and they'll you know plus or minus a couple of hundred probably depending on what um, you're actually supplying to the OEMs and they will typically give you two weeks to turn that quote around and what we see is that this this arrow going backwards here is deliberately drawn very faintly because this is the the missing link what happens is if they if they don't lose or nothing happens you know the OEM just goes quiet 
all that information is lost and I have to start all over again. So we've got customers now that are saving all this quote information and reusing, reusing, reusing. Now the good thing about this, that if you do win the business, then you launch a birth certificate typically and the birth certificate is often an Excel spreadsheet, it can be a Word document that then people fill in the information. So this is an example and uh, of the collaboration and the birth certificate gives you people like the people responsible to cost material etc. So if you've already done the quote and you win the business, you know um, we've got one customer that actually wanted a little trophy icon in the top right hand corner, it's like a little cup. So if they won the business they simply click on the cup, the, the trophy, and that auto populates what the information into the birth certificate for the start of a new project. And then other people can come in and then start populating the birth certificate with other information. So what we're going to show you is how uh, a typical example of the birth certificate, the information is populated and the information that's also being pulled from an ERP system and a dashboard that's then auto-generated from those multiple different birth certificates of all the different projects that the company has going within that organization. So here's an example in the middle this is being pulled from Centro. We can see you've got a direct link this is a 3D live image you can click back into this catalog if you want. You can see here the different people that um, they just simply pull down and select people that are responsible for the different things. Over here you've got volumes and things that are being actually populated from the, the, um, the quote sheet. Um, some of them are pull downs, other are auto populated. And if you scroll down, Plex information is coming from Plex ERP system. Then you've got all these dates that are being put in, et cetera, et cetera, onto the birth certificate. And you've got all these different projects going, right, with all these different people, all these different kickoffs. Where are we, right? And from here, you can simply jump to a dashboard that shows you where you are in and the red obviously highlights where you've got um, issues. You can hover, get the information about who's responsible, target date, actual date, etc., etc. If you've got any bottlenecks, they're shown here. And basically, you can drill down by any piece of metadata that's in your database. So now Jim's looking at manufacturing by manufacturing facility. Um, he can change the heat scale to highlight where there's problems and simply click on that information and find and drill down and find more information. So that's an example of where a customer has gone, love the system, but we have this quote sheet thing and birth certificate that we want you to put on the front end. So we literally took their Excel spreadsheet, built a web page that looked like their spreadsheet, and that now acts as a bi-directional conduit between the database and their spreadsheet. So in their case, I'm going to say 80% of the people that are using the system only look here on this dashboard and on those job sheets. The other 20% are actually using catalog. So it's an excellent example of pulling information from multiple databases, putting it in one location so people can see it, and they didn't have to one dot because it looks like the Excel spreadsheet, they're comfortable with it, they know exactly what they're doing, it's just more convenient because you've got the pull downs and the dates are simply you pop up a calendar and click automatically instead of them typing in dates, less mistakes, etc, etc. So I blitzed through that last um, bit of my presentation to try and keep get us back on time. Sorry about that. Any questions? For once I'm going to say good and I'm going to pass over to John.